Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky. Seven for the Dwarf Lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the Dark Lord on his dark throne. In the land of Mordor where the shadows lie, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. This is the War of the Ring. Hello, I'm Walder Richards from the Game Train and the strategy marathon continues after a bit of rust. We are back with Lord of the Rings War of the Ring. Pretty cool intro, huh? I like that one the most. Although, to tell you the truth, the good guy intro was constantly getting in its way trying to be the first one to show up. So you'll get to see it too because it just couldn't fuck off I guess oh well we'll get to it when we get to it it might show up in an extra video if it's not here so Lord of the Rings War of the Ring easily one of my favorite strategy games some people that have uh, played this with me suggest that it's very similar to uh, Warcraft 3 or something of the sort? Well, you probably know better if it is or not and if you don't, well, I guess you'll find out soon enough. I honestly don't know and I don't really care. They're here to play the campaign and that's exactly what they're going to do. Now, unlike the other strategy games in the Lord of the Rings universe, this one only has two factions. The good and the evil also known as uh, the forces of uh, free men or something like that or maybe armies of the free men I'm not entirely sure and of course the minions of evil we'll play through both of the campaigns because they are relatively short plus well they're not exactly the same we'll also show off the tutorial but that'll be for the extra video of this game. So let's get straight to it then. Since there isn't much to explain that you couldn't figure out in the campaign itself. When you click on the good guy campaign you will get a hold of this very nice map of the Middle Earth. Of course it doesn't really show the territories of the well, countries and whatnot, but that's okay. That is not entirely necessary. I do have to say, this map is pretty good looking. You'll also get the choice of uh, the difficulty setting right here. We'll take medium, because medium is nice. You can also reset any campaign progress if the, that you've done, in case you want to replay the fucking campaign again. And of course, there's the back button to go back and fuck off. But we won't be doing that because that would be just silly. Right now we got two missions available on our map, which are signified by this tree symbol. However, only one of them is actually available to us. Like, we can only play one, which is called the Grey Ledge. The other one, the Siege of the Iron Hills, that'll be only available after we beat the Grey Ledge. This is quite an interesting place to start a campaign. We're not starting at the Shire or Moria or somewhere where other games usually start, or even the or even the more action-oriented games of Lord of the Rings. Now we're gonna start a bit differently, because this is a bit of a different storyline we're going with. Think of this uh, as a official fan fiction, if that even makes sense. 
The Iron Hills echo with the sounds of clashing steel as the dwarves defend their homeland against a wicked orc onslaught. With the help of Gimli, son of Glowing, they prepare to rid the cliffs of the savage infestation. Gimli and his warriors must gather their forces, climb the nearby peaks, and crush their enemies under the weight of the mountain. Let's do exactly that. Keep in mind that each mission has their own specific uh, date. Time has come to drive the orcs from the Iron Hills. Look, up there. There's boulders on the cliffs above the orc camp. If we can gain those cliffs, we'll show the orcs what dwarves can do with stone. A few hard shoves will send some rock crashing down on orc heads. And here are our objectives. Since this is the very first mission that you'll play through the game, the mission is pretty simple. First you have to build yourself an encampment. Then we'll have to go find the orc encampment and wreck it. Oh, and kill some orc captain on our way. First things first, I'm gonna check on the sound cause Despite making slight modifications to the volume, it still is pretty damn loud. Alright, here's how it goes. Also we get a slight warning from the game that says that what we got right now is simply not enough to destroy the orcs, unless you use cheats, but that's not really fun. They're not gonna use cheats at all. Screw that. First things first, we're gonna need some workers. Since we're playing with the dwarves, we'll get uh, dwarf workers. But keep in mind that while playing in the skirmish mode or just in multiplayer, Waiting. you'll only get normal human workers and uh, it doesn't really matter what kind yes. of workers you got because uh, they're on the only difference here is by their looks. They're not different what? by stats. Uh. They don't have any stats that you have to worry about. A good idea for the beginning is to get yourself a group of workers. You see, we first have to build a mill and a foundry on top of the resources. You build a mill on the well to collect food, which is one of the primary resources. And you build a foundry on top of the ore pile to collect ore, which is the second primary resource. Now, building a foundry is not necessary because you can mine the ore without it, you just need to send workers right on top of it. However, foundries are just more efficient. You get a full bar of resources, which if I'm not mistaken is about 10, maybe 12 resources. It should be 10, but it seems to be a bit more by the looks of it. And if you try to mine the ore pile all by itself, you'll get a lot less resources. So, why the fuck should you waste your fucking time if you Wait. can uh, not waste your time? On it. The mill isn't, is absolutely necessary, however, because there's just no way to get food from a well. Now we did some pretty good progress. We can make two workers who will be our dedicated builders. I suggest putting four workers on each of the resources because that is the optimal amount of workers that you can use on the resource piles to get the resources at the best rate. Putting in more workers will simply waste time because uh, fifth, sixth and other workers will just have to yes. stay in line to wait until we have, in, we have an opening in the resource pile to go in and collect the resources. It's a waste of time, really. And you're better off sending those uh, extra workers to do building for you. So now we got workers. 
When you select a worker, you get the worker menu, which is down here. You probably see my finger, which is the cursor, naturally. Right now we don't have a whole lot of anything, but that's okay because this is the campaign and we're not supposed to have a lot of anything. We'll definitely need to upgrade the stronghold, but that'll be later. First we should also note the population. Population is a thing in here and the maximum population you can have is a hundred uh, units. Naturally this means that every unit has its own population. Workers take up one unit of population, whereas other units may take a bit more. I think the most a unit can take is 5, but we'll find that out mm, sooner or later. First thing you want to do when you start the game is build yourself the Dwarf Hole. What does that fucking do? Well, it'll let you summon more dwarves, naturally. With more dwarves, you'll be able to destroy the opposition rather effortlessly. By default, left clicking is used to select and deselect, while right clicking performs actions, as the game just said. However, I believe I have chosen the left click style to do f actions, because I'm just that used to Earth 2150. <laughs> It's just more convenient to do it like that, I don't know. Right, we built the dwarf hole, but first... Let's upgrade the stronghold, it's pretty simple, just click on the stronghold, which is this big house, and click on the stronghold level button. It'll take some time for the stronghold to fully upgrade, but don't worry, once it's done, Mm, only destruction of a stronghold can revert the effect, so you don't have to worry about anything like that. Upgrading the stronghold is absolutely necessary because it will unlock new buildings, new units, new upgrades, new everything. While it is upgrading, let us build some camps. Camps are used to increase the population limit. Ready. Each new camp increases the population limit by... how much is it? It doesn't save, but we'll find out soon enough. I believe it's 12. It should be at least, but there's also... A building has been here, if, but there's An also this little thing here. Completed. You can actually upgrade the camps to be war camps. They slightly increase the population limit more. So, maybe battle add the extra 2 points? Let's see. Camps are pretty easy to build, so I suggest a using only one worker on them. Alright, it gives you 11 points. The base camp gives you 11 population points upon construction. Now let's upgrade the war camps. I don't think we're gonna need a lot of units, but let's build one more camp just to make sure that we have a decent enough population limit to work with. It's better to have more than less, really. This isn't a kind of a game that rewards uh, having elite unit groups, you know? Like, you don't have to have a small but strong group of units, because that does not work here. There is no such thing as experience for the normal units, only a heroes. Has been upgraded. A building 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 has been completed. Thanks for interrupting me, game. <laughs> but yeah. Right. He, he only heroes have experience. So you don't have to worry about that on the units. Now we're gonna build ourselves the forge. It is our currently the, it is currently the only upgrade building that we have. Here's the thing you need to know about the upgrade buildings. Once the upgrade is built, you don't need the building anymore. It's only here to produce the upgrade. Once the upgrade is produced, you, the building is no longer necessary you can destroy it. But make sure that before you destroy the upgrade building that you get all of the upgrades that you can get out of it. Because, well, it would suck if you had to rebuild it. 
A building has been completed. An objective has been completed. The forge allows us to currently upgrade our weapons and armor. So let's queue up these upgrades. While it's doing that, let's make a few units. The dwarf hall. The dwarf hall. I keep saying hall for some reason. The Dwarf Hall allows you to build only two types of Dwarves, but that's okay because the, the forces of good are very generalized, so they only take the best out of each race that are considered the good guys. Here we have Dwarf Axe Throwers and Dwarf Shield Breakers. They're both good in their own merit, but there are definitely better counterparts. Axe Throwers are the ranged unit. Shield breakers have a melee unit. Let's get a couple of these guys. I really like the axe throwers because, well, they are range units. They can do damage from range. And anything that is ranged is always good. Get me a target. Here comes out our good old Where's friend. When you select the unit, you will notice that he has some interesting shit going on on him as well. I'm not sure what it. Oh wait, I know what this is. This is... Uh, I'll explain later. Well, the, the first thing you'll see definitely is his name. It's a little portrait. He looks fucking pissed. How much health he has. His stats and... Well, his role. An upgrade I'm not exactly sure how this works. I believe this is supposed to be considered as a range unit. It looks like a spear to me though, so I'm always confused by that. But you can hover your mouse over it and see what the unit counters are like. It can, This game kind of employs the rock paper scissors mechanic. There are certain types of units are strong against Get one type target. of unit, but they are not quite uh, strong against the other type. So melee units will be powerful against uh, range units apparently but the siege units are weak against it i think they are considered siege target. units i don't know that exactly it's a hammer so i can only assume it's a Just siege unit like here shield breaker has the hammer on him so i can assume he's a siege unit but he technically counts as melee so i don't know it's a bit of a weird situation with that so i usually just disregard it how are those upgrades coming in? Alright, good. Dwarf, the stats you? are quite interesting. Here we have attack, armor and kills. Kills! It's just a kill tally. It'll let you know how many bitches your particular unit has killed. Now attack and armor, that's the thing you need to worry about the most. Attack determines how much damage you deal with each hit. Armor determines how much damage you absorb and negate upon getting hit. Normally, axe throwers have the attack of 9 and armor of 0, which means they're quite squishy, but they can dish out some reasonable pain. With upgrades, or at least the two upgrades that you managed to get from the forge, yeah, it is called a forge. I, I keep thinking it's called a foundry for some reason. You will get uh, attack 10 and armor 1. You can upgrade attack and armor up to 3 times. But you can only do that once for each uh, thing now because of the fucking the campaign. So screw that. Where's the battle? Where is it? Dwarf shield breakers on the other hand already started with attack 10 and armor 1, so they're already much tougher to kill. They also have more health, so they are your designated dwarf melee units if you're into that kind of stuff. Where are they? they also have some specialized uh, things about them, like their special abilities, but we'll get to those when the time comes. Alright, I forgot we also have to build one more thing before we leave. A new watchtower. There's a little thing about uh, the way good guys build. They can't exactly expand a lot. When you click on a building that you want to build, you'll notice that there's a green area all over the fucking place. You also can't build things on uneven terrain, but that's quite obvious. For the good guys, you can only build in a green area of 
allowance, I guess. <laughs> because uh, it is encouraged that you make your bases tight and compact, because that makes uh, that makes it harder for the enemies to attack the attack your base at a, at a larger scale. You know, if your base is really packed tight. The enemy will only be able to attack one or two things at the same time. If your base is loose and open wide like this, their army could attack everything at the same time and you could potentially die. So you're basically trying to build a, like a very tight ball of buildings so that you could uh, maximize your chances of survival. Not that it's necessary most of the time, if you got decent defenses and an army to work with, that is definitely not necessary. Evil uh, team works a bit differently in that regard, but we'll get to that once we start the evil campaign.